I'm Tino from Gold Coast, Queensland. Today I'm here in Shanghai on Australia Day. We're on the ground talking to people about the current Australia-China trade tensions. We'll be talking to people with direct experience doing business here in China and with those directly affected by the situation we find ourselves in. What's happening, who's hurting, what can be done and who can help. China is a vast market and very important one for many Aussie businesses. Yet there's a lot to navigate to maintain good relationships. Understanding culture, language, common practices are the key to doing this. Sometimes the people in high office need a helping hand to connect the experience of those risking it and reaching abroad to do business. So Synology Solutions and I have joined a group of concerned Synologists and Australian global entrepreneurs who are seeking to gain ground level perspective from the many people and businesses significantly affected by the high level disputes. And we want to share these so they can help to move things in a positive direction for all. I was in Shanghai to meet a remarkable Australian lady, Heidi Dugan, who has been there for over two decades. Heidi is a television personality that has millions of daily viewers, is an influencer, an author and a China expert. Here's what Heidi had to say about the situation. Hi, my name's Heidi. I've been in China now for over 24 years and I really sort of grew in this market through my TV show, You Are The Chef. Some of the factors I think that have come about with the China-Australian tensions over the last um, few years has been really sort of exasperated by a lot of the the economic tensions that have been placed on it and that's you know things like COVID and everything else that's sort of uh, to do with it you know not being able to travel and being wary of those products that are coming through cold chain or frozen chain um, logistics. I think when we can start as a government to understand the problems that the other one is facing that we can actually start to work together to solve that problem. The, the fact is, we've been friends for 50 years and that's an incredibly long relationship. That's more than most of us as individuals have with friends. The fact is, is that when we all work together as Australians and we push forward together and represent an amazing products and Australian excellence, then that is when we're going to have an even bigger impact in this market. It's when we fight with each other and we try to, you know, push other Australians out. That's when we're fighting against ourselves and there's no momentum. So I would like to leave it with all those people who said, China is a massive market. It is, it does take commitment, but I'd really love to see everyone really banding together instead of moving forward together, because that's when we're gonna see just the most incredible impact in China and ultimately the Chinese consumer is going to see that we are band together and that we're here to stay and that we actually also care about the Chinese consumer. Thank you Heidi, it was great speaking with you. Let's hear from my mate Mike. He's the chair of South China Australian Chamber of Commerce here in Guangzhou. Let's hear what he has to say about it all. So when you have two different countries two different people, two different values. I hate to see that, how much difference is going to be more. So it takes understanding, like a family, it takes understanding. So, and it takes, again, it probably takes respect, understanding and respect. So I think in our deed, we have to understand more and respect more. And then uh, I think then we'll, we'll, the Chinese will see it because the, the, these days the Chinese government is actually quite smart, you know. Uh, they'll see it and then they'll come to terms with it because because your actions, your deeds speak louder than your words. Rather than then trying to change each other's value, why don't we just respect who, that's who you are. Australia has done nothing bad to China either, apart from on TV by a Prime Minister saying bad things about China. The average Australian person and business hasn't done much bad, anything bad to China either, apart from supplying them with a really good lobster and beef and wine and we've done nothing wrong. Now let's hear Richard Harmon's take on what's going on. New Zealand recognised China as a market economy and promoted its membership of the World Trade Organisation. The suggestion is that the Biden administration is going to be much more active in seeking regional alliances and thus trying to incorporate New Zealand into those alliances. If Australia is to put more pressure on New Zealand 
over China, then that is going to put, make life difficult for New Zealand. The hope here is that the Biden administration will say, OK, we understand your commercial relationship with China, really your economic dependence on China, but we do want you to speak up on human rights. Um, and New Zealand politicians are used to managing it. And New Zealand Prime Minister says repeatedly that if New Zealand's got something to say about China, it will say it to China in private. I think Australia's got a different perspective on its role in the world, and it sees itself as a middle power and someone who should be listened to. And we have to remember also that it, that it tended to increase a bit during the Trump administration, when it was clear that Morrison was trying to develop a close relationship with both Trump and Pompeo. It's not the New Zealand style to go around telling people what to do. Now, if they decide that they want to wind back the confrontation, then Australia will wind back its confrontational approach to China. Now, Australia is going to be a major player in any of those developments. Um, and its close relationship with the United States, similar to Japan's close relationship, will determine how the relationship with China goes, I think. Another Kiwi, David Mann, has spent decades in China and knows what he's talking about when it comes to dealing with China. Let's check out what he reckons might be going on. So we're talking to our clients in other um, countries, the Netherlands, um, Germany, you know, UK. There is a consolidating anti-China perception, socially and politically, in the West. Um, and it's not just something that's a phenomenon of the Trump era. This has been coming for some time. Uh, you could almost argue that Bill Clinton began it. It's had various iterations, but it's become more and more strategically um, fraught related to the Five Eyes system. Um, um, and whether you're Canada, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, or the States, there is this idea that these are the good people. They're the ones that set the global laws, help establish the, the main forums for the world. And therefore, um, in recent years, uh, and certainly under Trump and the end of Obama's years, the Five Eyes obligations on all of us have been greater and greater. And that's really um, hurt New Zealand's position with China, and it's wounded Australia's position deeply. The way in which Australia re-engaged with China was under the Whitlam government, and that engagement was pretty comprehensive and very thought through. Um, and Bob Hawke and Keating both were quite remarkable in the way they handled the China relationship. I mean, the scale of Australian companies and the range of its um, exports and services compared to its population is, is just staggering. So Australia is an untapped power that's currently um, partly smothering itself. If we think we have to stick with the um, old white club, the old um, British Empire club, even as it's manifest in America, we'll gradually lose relevance in Asia. So it's concerning, but I would say that I have confidence in the pragmatism of the companies of Australasia and the influence they have on politics and public debate to in the end really kind of reset this. It might take two or three years, but I'm pretty optimistic actually. The New Zealand government has had great success with China trade and upgraded the China Free Trade Agreement in January 2021. In December last year, the New Zealand Foreign Affairs Minister Mahuta offered to help and the New Zealand Trade Minister suggested Australia be more respectful to China. Ni hao. I am delighted to welcome the signing today by Trade Ministers of the upgrade to New Zealand's Free Trade Agreement with China. Just over a year ago, on the sidelines of our last in-person meeting in Bangkok, China's Premier Li Keqiang and I announced the conclusion to negotiations on the upgrade. This upgrade reflects the value both countries place on our bilateral relationship. China is New Zealand's largest trading partner. Our comprehensive strategic partnership brings benefit to the people of both countries. We know from experience just how important our first free trade agreement was advancing our relationship with China, with benefits to both sides far beyond just trade. 
So, next we hear from Glenn Hawken, Lead Consultant at Alwood Street Management Consultants, based in Queensland, Australia. Um, so it, it is a worrying time and it, it would be nice to um, come to some sort of, you know, mediation process as to how this is. But from most reports, you know, getting two, two parties to the table at the moment has not been, uh, not been an easy thing nor, nor a definite time frame on that. So it's a challenge. The government and the media are really the ones that are, that are in, in discourse, whereas um, business to business or, or consumer, at least at the wholesale level, uh, import export, they're, they're all ready to go. There, there's no, um, there's no coalface, pardon the pun. You know, we have our fair share of racism and, and things like that, which does get um, hit along by by certain segments of, of the population, and that that again makes headlines, even though it's a very very minor, you know, percentage of people that that really fall into that category. You know, let's shake hands and get on with the fact that the suffering people are actually the people who who need to get back to a level of commerce here, not not a, an element at, at the highest end. So, I think both countries, you know, need to acknowledge that that each country has sensitivities around certain topics. Uh, I think there is an acknowledgement there that that we need to, you know, get back to the mutual respect that we do have, acknowledging the differences that do exist. I feel that a, a lot of the strength in those voices get lost when people decide to use the keyboard as opposed to the voice and, and social media and, and those sort of things. Thanks, Glenn. Really interesting points you mentioned. Now let's hear what Andrew has to say. He's an Aussie grain farmer and chair of Grain Producers Australia. Yeah, so Andrew Wiedemann, I'm chairman of uh, Grain Producers Australia. Grain Producers Australia is uh, the peak industry body for grain growers here in Australia. I'm a farmer here uh, in Victoria, a farm, family farm, trading to the Chinese for a significant amount of time. Uh, look, in terms of uh, building fences between Australia and China, uh, I've reached out publicly on a range of mediums because we've been involved obviously with uh, the recent dispute right from the start between Australia and China in regards to Bali. Uh, and I think, you know, our two governments have been warring with one another during this time, which uh, has probably not really helped the situation at all. The Chinese uh, have uh, been buying barley from Australia uh, for nigh on 40 odd years now, so uh, the, and malting barley, uh, and more in the last decade they've stepped over to be buying feed barley from Australia as well. So it's been a, a market of choice, uh, particularly for the trade and particularly for the Australian farmer. Um, Look, I think in terms of how our government can solve it, I think the only way is really being able to sit down in the room and, and try and work our differences out. And, and clearly that's not happening at the moment. The action against uh, China with the World Trade Organisation, we didn't support that from Grain Producers Australia's perspective. We don't see that that's going to really resolve uh, what we see as the important things is actually just sitting down and trying to work through what our differences really have been. Uh, we know that Australia is rich in plenty of uh, minerals and, and grain and food and, and uh, the Australian farmer has really grown to uh, appreciate the market with China uh, and so we find it pretty tough I suppose in terms of uh, our countries not being able to work together as collectively as it has been and we'd like to be a part of trying to restore that uh, uh, between our two countries. Uh, look and I think you know in terms of um, how this is impacting on the Australian farmer will look certainly in the short term there's been some financial loss. I think from the Australian farmer's perspective we would really like and appreciate to be back involved with the Chinese uh, selling our barley and, and obviously you know you guys appreciating uh, our beer really and uh, that's made from, from the malt that uh, we're producing. I'll tell you what I'll, I'll donate um, half a dozen cases of Crown Lager to the government to sit down with our government and uh, we'll sit in a room and we'll sort it out. There you go. Here's Hazza, a highly successful Aussie working in broadcasting here in China. We sat down for a chat recently on my trip to Guangzhou in February 2021. It's a tough time. It's a tough time to be a representative of our country. And it's also a difficult time to try and be that 
you know, middle ground between China and Australia. But one of the major problems is that there is a huge cultural difference between Australia and China. So sometimes here in China, media is, uh, it's very, it's uh, very consistent. Whereas Australia, media is quite, you know, independent. So each media outlet has their own perspective, their own standpoint. And at the same time, our governmental system works completely different to the Chinese system. So there are politicians in Australia who might express an opinion, who might say something, but it does not represent the official stance of Australia. My interpretation is that a lot of people in Australia truly, really want a better relationship with China. A lot of people would like our government to take the right steps and make the, the right moves to improve the relationship with China. But unfortunately, at this time, that is quite challenging. And as a country who is export oriented, we really need to take a step back and think about the future. We need to have a far-sighted approach when it comes to our strategy with China. The tensions between Australia and China are born mainly out of misunderstandings. There are messages that are coming out of Australia that are interpreted in the way that comes across as extremely negative in China. We really need to have people in government and in powerful positions that can advise politicians how messages will be interpreted here in China, especially in Beijing. China does not want to change who we are. I've said this before, China benefits from us being a democratic, capitalist-based, free market system. We also benefit from the way China is. China doesn't want to change us. We should not want to change China. And as a small country, a relatively small country with a small population, Australia has a lot more to lose than China has to lose if there is a conflict between our country and China. I've been trying to do the best that I can while representing my country as best that I can and I hope that Australians can appreciate that. So, in conclusion, how are we going to get past this and what are we going to do about it? Well, after listening to all those we have spoken to and hearing their stories and comments, the main thing that stands out is we have to mutually respect each other's differences and values and keep things moving forward. Social media diplomacy and publicly criticising other countries to score domestic political points can lead to some worrying situations. I can't help thinking Andrew is right. Despite our differences in values, we need to sit down at the same table over a few drinks and try and sort things out as soon as possible. We will all be better off for it. What do you think? Cheers.